All right, let's get started like we normally do. You've all done this before, so short period of bell meditation. Go ahead and get into a nice meditation posture. I'll give you a moment, and then we'll start at the sound of the bell. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the teaching. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the talk. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I have taken refuge in the Buddha. I have taken refuge in the Dhamma. I have taken refuge in the Sangha. Three pure precepts. Cease to do harm. Do only good, do good for others. Bodhisattva vow. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to lead them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Swaha. And hello, Alex. Glad you joined us today. Make sure I didn't miss anybody else that slipped in. All right. So, today, still Eightfold Path. Today we're going to talk about livelihood. And here's something about the Eightfold Path. Oh, hold on a second here. So again, today, talk about the Eightfold Path. Uh, we'll want to look at different views of the Eightfold Path. Uh, 
a lot of times when people are thinking Eightfold Path, they go right back to the very traditional, which is good. We want to understand the traditional. But like I always talk about, we have to bring the teachings and the concepts and the ideals forward, right? And we have to look at them differently dependent on our culture, right? Our time, our context. So in the time and the culture of Siddhartha, when they were going to determine what was an appropriate livelihood or right livelihood, as you see in the Eightfold Path, well, it was causally dependent on what the job was. So keying in on the word what. What was the job? Here's the example. Uh, in the Vinaya Sutta, it presents them this way. It says, these are what is not appropriate. Uh, business in weapons, business in meat, business in human beings, business in uh, intoxicants, and business in poison. So these were viewed as livelihoods that would lead to personal and societal suffering. And we look at the list, can't hardly disagree with that. Right? All of these would certainly have uh, unwholesome effects, if you would, self, others, and society. So they were drawn, though, from the limited employment opportunities of Siddhartha's time and culture. And, of course, we have to consider, too, that there were class and societal restrictions that made some professions being determined solely by what caste someone was in. So choice of job wasn't even always possible. So this must have made this idea of right livelihood even uh, a little more difficult to navigate. So a lot of time and effort is put into translating these job specifics into the employment possibilities of today. So we got to jump this forward, right, to us. And uh, Buddhists, you know, we have to be able to choose appropriate livelihoods or right livelihoods. So we have to think about it differently. Invariably, confusion, anxiety arises in the jobs that may not seem to fit into the above categories. Uh, and these uh, confusion and anxiety arises because there's concerns over things like violence in the job, harming living beings, aggression, uh, whether that be physical and maybe a abusive language even. Um, let's see, politics, the military, law enforcement, book retail, lawyers, exterminators. I mean, there's a host of, of careers that there can be confusion and anxiety in trying to say, oh my gosh, is this a a right livelihood. Hello, Chris. Glad you made it. So things are just much more complicated today. I mean, look around, right? Uh, this complication, though, it, it requires us to take a more situational view of our livelihood. So this is, in a way, a good thing because, again, we're, we have to learn how to be situational in our practices. So we need to view the livelihood, then, less about what the job is, you know, the title, if you would, uh, but more about how that job is pursued, right? How do you go about the day-to-day -day activities of the job, and what do you do to help transform those things that you may find negative, you know, within, of course, the boundaries of the job that you're working? Our contemporary world requires insight into the reality that how a livelihood is pursued can, in our time, in our context, in our culture, have more value than what livelihood is pursued. And of course, this is dependent on each unique situation, right? Each unique experience and has. So livelihood isn't just weapons, meat, human beings, intoxic intoxicants, and poison. It goes further than that, but we can also look at how we look at our jobs, right? How we uh, interact with our jobs rather than just what that job is. The Buddha teaches that the Dharma is as subject to causal conditioning as any other aspect of human existence, right? So it's always changing, always transforming. There's always uh, some type of causal factor at work. And so the ideal of appropriate livelihood or right livelihood is no exception. In the Maga Vibhanga Sutta, the Buddha offers a pragmatic teaching on the future necessity of analyzing each aspect of the Eightfold Path. 
So he begins by saying this. He says, I will teach and analyze for you the noble eightfold path. Listen and pay close attention. I will speak. So he starts talking about the different aspects of the Eightfold Path, but when he reaches appropriate livelihood or right livelihood, he just says, and what monks is right livelihood? There is the case where a disciple of the Noble Ones, having abandoned dishonest livelihood, keeps his life going with right livelihood. This monks is called right livelihood. Now, seems kind of vague. But here again, the Buddha is speaking to monks who aren't really engaged in any employment anyway, but he's telling them these things for the purpose of guiding the laity. But for a contemporary disciple of the Noble Path, you and I, there are two important words in this sutra, in this section of the sutra. Uh, that is analyze and dishonest. Abandoned dishonest livelihood being the, the three words there together. Uh, we have to set aside the view of what a job is in favor of a more appropriate view of how that job is engaged. So a disciple that experiences any dishonesty, right? This is a word the Buddha used, dishonest. Uh, if it's generated by the self or it's generated by another in a livelihood, then there may be the responsibility to walk away, to say, I can't do this job. That's, that would be the traditional response, if you will. Something's wrong in what the job is, I got to go. Or we can take a pragmatic view and work toward a positive transformation in that livelihood. For example, if you're being asked in a job, you need to lie to the client about this. You need to just tell them something that you know is patent, patently untrue. What do you do? Do you say, okay, bite the bullet and do what you know is wrong? Or do you say, but maybe instead of saying it this way, how about we say it this way? Right? We reword it or we give them a little bit of different information and be honest about it. That's transforming the job rather than walking away from the job. So in these difficult economic times, and in this money-driven culture that we live in, we as Buddhist disciples, we might have to remain in what seems a dishonest livelihood in order to support ourselves and our families. While we also might be striving to find more appropriate employment, that may be happening too. But it all boils down to, as Buddhists, we may need to endure some negativity in a job in order to provide the positives of shelter and sustenance for ourselves and our family. That may be the choice we have to make. Again, is this easy? No. But it's extremely valuable. So how would the Buddha have viewed a livelihood, say, that involved dealing in non-lethal weapons for self-defense and law enforcement? Well, I'm talking here weapons like tasers and beanbag guns, right? Non-lethal. Or how would he have felt about free-range chickens and cows and pigs or maybe even meat grown in test tubes? Uh, how would he have felt maybe about temporary employment agencies that supply people for jobs? or even adoption agencies that find homes for children? What about opiates for pain relief and medical marijuana? Or organic pesticides and pheromone-based vermin repellents? What if Buddha got exposed to all those, right? Taking a view based on a traditional understanding from the Vinaya Sutta these livelihoods would just be automatically deemed inappropriate. Done, period, walk away. But if we take a closer view, a more pragmatic view, and we give an honest evaluation, well, we can get a different conclusion. 
the what would fall away and be replaced by an examination of the how. So, set aside the label and look at how the job is done. So, how the pursuit of any job or career affects the individual performing it, right? We got to think about how it affects us, but then we have to think about how it affects the community as a whole and even the more encompassing planet as a whole. We want to look at those effects rather than any specific job title. So, we're taking it from looking at the label to looking at the action. Seems more important, right? So there are a lot of vocations that are clearly inappropriate. Let's just throw some of them out there. Get this out of the way. If you're an assassin for hire, it's inappropriate. Illegal drug dealer, and let's get serious too. There are some legal drug dealers who use deceit and intimidation to sell their product. They're wrong too. Uh, slavery in any form, and there's all kinds of forms of it. Uh, let's see, uh, working in a, a slaughterhouse, you know, that seems, and other jobs like that, right? These are obviously inappropriate. You don't even have to think about it. But it doesn't take much analyzing to figure that out. But for other jobs, an honest evaluation has to be made of both how that work affects the employee, how it affects the community. And in the Mahavibhanga Sutta, the Buddha said that one must abandon dishonest livelihoods or if we want to engage in some contemporary creative redescription that's more apt for us, uh, we must just honestly analyze our livelihood. Thinking differently about livelihood. Viewing the arising of how we look at a job and the falling away of what the name of a job is uh, this is important in a contemporary engagement of this ideal of appropriate livelihood. You have to put some thought into it. Right? There is more to the karmic consequences of a job than just whatever the final product is or that final action. Because there is always how the job is done, whether it's in an office or a warehouse or a factory or what other venue it might be. So I want to give you some examples. There's a company that makes beanbag guns for law enforcement, right? Non-lethal beanbag guns. I don't know if you know what one of these are, but they shoot a, a beanbag, just like you would throw as a kid, but a little heavier. Uh, they use air pressure, and they shoot it out, and it hits you, and it knocks you down. It's supposed to be non-lethal. Well, they're meant to be used to subdue wrongdoers with a minimum amount of physical damage. That's a good thing. But what if that same company is also making these available to the general public? It kind of might change your view, right? And especially, I mean, I think of the tasers, for example, because you can go to the flea markets around here and buy a taser. But think of them being used inappropriate, you know? Think of the whole idea of don't tase me, bro, right? These can be used inappropriately. So these are things we have to think about. So there's the example of scientists. Uh, they grow a bovine or cow muscle meat in the lab. Okay, it is beef flesh that's meant to act as a substitute for the animal-derived product in order to make it marketable to people that are sensitive about animals. And also to scale back the damage that livestock farming does to the environment. Good things. But to, get, to begin the process, there has to be a cut of meat from the animal, right? You know, it, it starts with some live flesh. But after that, whatever is produced is advertised as animal free. Does the killing of one animal make it right? That's a question. Does the scaling back of environmental damage make it right? These are the kind of questions we have to ask about Livelihoods. How is the job done? Adoption agencies. Okay, adoption agencies find homes for children and children for loving parents to care for. Again, good thing. But where do the children come from? 
Uh, is there a corporate environment of profit over the welfare of the children, or does the children's welfare come first? If you worked at an adoption agency, that's the kind of question you'd need to ask. Because that's where the transformation may need to happen, right? And I mentioned Book Retail, a publisher specializing in books about spirituality and self-improvement. They regularly contribute money and time to worthy causes. Uh, the company is known for public generosity. But in the office, it's a whole nother story. Employees are underpaid. They don't have health insurance. Management is unresponsive to issues. Sexual harassment is ignored. And the office environment itself is just one of gossip and ill will and people being afraid of losing their jobs. Is it appropriate to work in a negative environment in order to produce a positive product? Not good office environment, but sending out books to help people deal with their own office environments, for example. So this is what we have to look at. So to, to determine appropriate livelihood requires just a view beyond just whatever the finished product or the service is. Because products and services, that is what is being done, right? But the how that it's being done, that's equally important. So, threw something new in there. I said we were going to set aside what for how. We talked about looking at how a job is performed, but now we're back to saying, but how is equally important to what? Because it is. Because what tells us, the, the idea of the what points us directly to what the job is, what the product and end service is, which is something we also have to look at too. But in today's environment, we can look at how first. Because again, Economics being what they are, we all got to have a job. So there is another aspect to livelihood that we also have to honestly analyze. How do you approach the job? So now we're throwing some responsibility your way. It doesn't matter what the job is at this point. This is all about how you approach the job. The employer rightly expects you to come to work and, well, to work. So, if you spend more time socializing than doing the job, you are the cause of an, an, of an inappropriate livelihood. You cause the arising of an inappropriate livelihood for you and other employees. For example, if you go to work each day with a negative attitude, then you're making it an inappropriate livelihood. Focusing on tasks necessary to do your job and avoiding the distractions offered by other employees is engaging in an appropriate livelihood. See how it's being done, right? So the Eightfold Path is a great guide for how to act at work. Right? Appropriate view, appropriate intent, and speech, and action, and effort, and mindfulness, and concentration. These are all really wholesome dispositions and habits to have in the workplace. So a Buddhist has the responsibility to determine the how and then to make the appropriate decision based on personal and societal need, knowledge, experience, and that learned wisdom, that wisdom that we work so hard to develop. The idea is to do the most appropriate thing given whatever unique situation is experienced. So a Buddhist then, we got to always keep uh, in our body minds that the Dharma as offered by the Buddha is a guide that must be applied to the reality of whatever situation we're engaging. So remember, not dogmatic rules, right? We have to look at these things situationally, look at the traditional, learn from it, then we have to bring it forward into our context and our time and our culture. And experience it, right? Get that uh, experiential verification that it can work.
All right. Questions, comments?